We all want to believe that what we do, how we behave, is purely a function of our personality, our character, things inside of us, our genetic makeup. But to what extent are we influenced by the situation, by the circumstances, by the social context, things around us? Stanley Milgram performed one of the most important, powerful demonstrations of the power of situational forces to transform people to get people to do things they could not imagine doing. He and I were classmates at James Monroe High School in the Bronx back in the 1950s. And he was concerned, being a Jewish kid, that the Holocaust could happen again in America, that he and his family could be put in a concentration camp. And people said, don't be stupid, Stanley. That was Nazi Germany, that was then. He said, how do you know? And he was concerned that, you know, Hitler got young people, the Hitler Jungen, to, to kill. He said, you know, would you kill if somebody, an authority figure like, like Hitler, you know, challenged you? And people said, no, I wouldn't do that. He said, how do you know unless you were put in the situation? So what Stanley Milgram did in his famous uh, series of studies called Blind Obedience to Authority, he took ordinary people, a thousand of them, 500 from Bridgeport, Connecticut, 500 from, from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, at Yale where he was teaching, and put them in a situation where an authority figure encourage them to keep shocking over and over again a victim. But what was critical is the authority figure dressed in a lab coat was the influence agent. The person he was influencing as the teacher was just an ordinary person. But the person being shocked, the learner, the victim, was a confederate. The teacher thought he was helping to improve the memory of the student, of his student, or her student when they ran women. But in fact, what they had to do was keep delivering more and more painful shocks on a scale that started with 15 volts and ended with 450. And one of the con conclusions of this research that I'd like you to take away is all evil begins with 15 volts, with a small first step. So let's look at how this study was con contrived, developed, and the powerful impact it had on the people in it. In 1962, Stanley Milgram shocked the world with his study on obedience. To test his theories, he invented an electronic box that would become a window into human cruelty. In ascending order, a row of buttons marked the amount of voltage one person would inflict upon another. Milgram's original motive for the experiment was to understand the unthinkable how the German people could permit the extermination of the Jews. When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. The problem I wanted to study was a little different. It went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Learn. All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the uh, learner up so that he can get some sort of punishment. What inspired Milgram, I would say there were a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment that he could think of. Would you roll up your right sleeve, please? This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. 
Do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? About two years ago, I was at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. There's nothing serious, but as long as I'm having these shocks, uh, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please, in the next room? But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experimenter. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as teacher, you are seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts, and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally, XXX, danger severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is to teach the learner a simple word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts, and you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105 volts. <coughs> Hard hit. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as is necessary. What do you mean, as far as is necessary? Milton was very much aware that obedience is a necessary ingredient for society to function. But he focused on the darker side of obedience. Incorrect. 150 volts. Oh. Sad face. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. Now, this man makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now, other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. It's hair. 75 volts, Jim. Oh. <laughs> you don't know that. Please continue. Some psychologists were troubled by the ethics of it. Many, if not most, subjects found it a highly stressful, conflicted experience. People are stammering, stuttering, laughing hysterically and appropriately. 150 volts. Oh. Experimenter, that's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let me out. Let me out. Clearly, you know, when we say people went to the top of the shock board, it wasn't like they were going blithely, sadistically. People went stop and go, stop and go. They were in a state of conflict, which was created a tremendous amount of stress. So that was the main critique. This will be at 3.30. Ah! As his voice began to show increasing frustration, uh, so did I. And I was really in a state of... Uh, real conflict and agitation. One of Stanley Milgram's basic contributions was that you don't ask people what they would do given this hypothetical situation. You put them in the situation. Wrong. I love the 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. 180 volts. Oh, I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. You can't stand it. I'm not going to kill that man today. According to Milgram, one of the things that's a prerequisite for carrying out acts that are evil is to shed responsibility from your shoulders and, and hand it over to the person in charge. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. He didn't hold any gun to anybody's head. Just the fact that he conveyed a sense of authority. Roughly 60, 65 percent of the people went all the way to the top of the shock board. 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Don't the man's help mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must. But he might be dead in there. 
Milgram made the point, I think, very effectively, that the Nazis weren't all a bunch of psychopaths at Belsen and Dachau, that you could staff a death camp from the middle class in New Haven. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was, but he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he got to keep going. What kind of obedience would Milgram guess today if he were to do the experiment today? Probably about the same. Probably about the same. Why? I don't know. I think people are just inherently obedient. It just really shows like how far human beings will go to appease what they perceive to be an authority figure. Milgram has identified one of the constants, one of the universals of social behavior. The readiness to obey authority cuts across time. It's a constant. The other outstanding and distinctive thing about the obedience experiment is how much it has and keeps on permeating contemporary culture uh, and thought. It's still with us in very, very important ways. In the experiment you just saw, Two-thirds of all ordinary people who were participants went all the way, went to 450 volts. When it got to 375 volts, the guy was screaming, and then there was a thud, there was silence. And he could be dead or he could be unconscious. So if you were doing critical thinking, if you were that teacher in that, uh, the, the mock teacher in that study, you should have said, it doesn't make sense for me to keep shocking. How could I be improving his memory if he's unconscious or worse if he's dead? But nobody asked that question. They were trapped in the power of that situation. But I said, Milgram ran a thousand person, people. This was only one study. He actually did 19 different experiments. In each one, he varied one aspect of the social situation. And in some studies, he got conformity, compliance, obedience up to 90%. When? When, when you came in as a participant, and you saw somebody like you go all the way, then nine out of 10 times you went all the way. What happens if you come in and you see somebody like you rebel, then nine out of 10 times you refuse. So it tells us people are powerful social models. What about women? No different than men. Uh, their obedience level was again in the 60s. So the Stanley Milgram study is one demonstration of the power of the situation over individuals. It doesn't mean personality is not important, but in a new situation, those social factors in that context can sway us in ways that we don't realize. The study has been repeated, replicated many times in many different countries with the same effect. The majority, more than 50%, can be seduced by those powerful situational forces.